Hi, I'm Martin Sweatman, and in this video, I'll continue my review of the Younger Dryas Impact Debate Research. So far, we've covered the published research from the original Firestone et al. paper in 2007 through to the end of 2017 in the last video, using the new bibliography at the Cosmic, Cosmic Tusk website. So in this video, I'm going to review most of the papers in 2018. Now, we've seen that it's absolutely clear the Younger Dryas impact happened. The layer of platinum found across North America and Greenland with indications it might extend into Europe at the base of the Younger Dryas black mat and coinciding with other impact indicators like nano diamonds and impact spherules effectively proves it. The only issues to be resolved are whether and how it actually triggered the Younger Dryas mini ice age and whether and how it led to the extinction of many species of megafauna and changes in human cultures. Now, given the highly coincident timing between the platinum spike in Greenland and the onset of cooling, it seems very likely it did trigger the Younger Dryas cooling, but proving it is another matter. And from the evidence we've seen so far, whether directly from the initial blasts and extensive wildfires or indirectly as a result of the Younger Dryas climate change and destruction of vegetation and habitats, it does seem likely that it had a profound effect on the megafauna and human populations. But again, proving it is another matter. So given this state of affairs, and to speed things up slightly, I'm not going to spend much time from here on on papers that simply confirm the event happened. We know it did, and it was massive. I'm instead looking for evidence of its global extent, how far around the world its effects reached, and for its effects on climate, megafauna, and human populations. So let's look at the papers in 2018 in this bibliography. Here they are. We have two more supportive papers from the Mahaney group that I'll review at the end of this series. And this paper from Ardeline et al. is only tentatively supportive of the impact theory. I looked at their paper uh, and essentially they investigate another ancient lake bed in uh, Mexico, finding the Younger Dryas black mat, radiocarbon dated to about the right time, but they don't find any nano diamonds or impact spherules there. So it doesn't have a lot to add to what we currently know. So that leaves the papers by Wolbach et al. and the responses to it in 2020, so this year, uh, which I'll review in the next video. So that just leaves the three papers highlighted here, uh, which I'll review for you in this video. So let's get started, and I'll start with the paper by Jair et al. Now this paper made headlines when it was first released in 2018. The authors convincingly show they discovered a relatively young impact crater on the northeast edge of the Greenland ice sheet. In fact, the most remarkable thing about it is that this has remained hidden until now because it's such an obvious feature. Uh, you can see it easily in Google Earth. Anyway, it's a large crater, about 31 kilometers across, which implies that a dense asteroid, about one kilometer across, or perhaps a dense comet, about a mile across, made it. And it clearly is an impact crater. The authors find all the usual signals of a cosmic impact, including the crater shape with a central uplift and shot quartz and other minerals. So the key issue for us really is its age. Now we know it has to be relatively young, geologically speaking, because it hasn't been eroded away by the Greenland ice sheet. Another telling feature is that it obliterates these drainage channels. But again, these channels could be a few million years old themselves. So it really could be anywhere up to a few million years old and therefore it doesn't need to be related to the Younger Dryas impact event at all. Having said that, there are unconfirmed indications of a very young age, so it might well be related to the Younger Dryas impact. We'll just have to wait and see what the published science says in the years to come. But let's just think about that. If this is indeed one of the Younger Dryas impactors, at around a mile wide, it implies a truly massive and awesome event. 
a globally important event. And our modern religions, with all their catastrophic imagery and tone, the fire and brimstone and the flood myths and so on, which are probably baggage carried over from prehistoric times, now begin to make a lot of sense. And so does Gebekli Tepe. Anyway, that's going beyond this paper into other places. Let's get back to the science. Now our next paper is quite an interesting effort. Here, a group of volcanologists try to link the Larcher Sea volcanic eruption with the Younger Dryas cooling. So they are making the hypothesis that the Younger Dryas climate change only, and not necessarily all the other things such as the megafaunal extinctions, was caused by this volcanic eruption and not a cosmic impact event. Now, to be fair, the authors are suitably tentative because they realize their evidence is thin and we'll see just how thin it is in a minute. But first, I want to just think about the motivation for this work. You see, what we have here is a group of volcanologists and until recently, say 30 years ago, volcanologists thought they were the most important people on Earth, researching the most destructive forces on Earth. We now know that honor is held by cosmic impact scientists, not volcanologists. But nevertheless, it's hard to relinquish that power. So there's a kind of turf war between cosmic impact scientists and volcanologists as to who has the more to say about extinction events, massive and sudden climate change, and other ancient disasters. And we see the same war going on in the debate about the dinosaur ending extinction 66 million years ago. Anyway, enough of that preamble. Let's look at the actual evidence in this paper. So these guys claim the Larcher Sea volcanic eruption might have been responsible for the Younger Dryas cooling. Now the key for us is the timing of these events. Yes, it probably is possible for a volcanic eruption of the right kind and size to trigger an ice age if Earth's climate is precariously balanced at the time. The same argument is used to justify a comet impact causing the Younger Dryas cooling. Because Earth's climate was going through an unstable period of adjustment, making the transition from full ice age conditions to the interglacial period we now live in, it's especially prone to being knocked sideways or perturbed. So if a cosmic impact could have caused the cooling, then a volcanic eruption could do so too. But this is not the point. The point is timing. We need to see clear evidence of timing. The cooling should occur immediately after the event, whatever it was either a cosmic impact or a volcanic eruption. So this is what we should focus on. Now we've seen plenty of examples already where scientists have used the uncertainty in the radiocarbon measurements to argue that two events could be simultaneous or alternatively that they need not be. That's the beauty of uncertainty. So as you'd expect, these authors offer a lot of data for the larger sea eruption that show its dating has enough uncertainty to be consistent with the Younger Dryas cooling. But just as the resolution to this problem in archaeology is to look at the stratigraphy, the resolution to this problem here is to look at evidence for this timing from within the same record. In other words, it's no good comparing the climate response recorded by an Antarctic ice core with the volcanic record in a Lithuanian lake bed sediment, because we don't know how well the dates of these two records line up. If we're going to show causality, we really need to look for evidence of climate change and volcanic eruption in the same record to see if they coincide. And in their paper, the authors only present one data set that actually does this. It's our old favorite, the Greenland GISP-2 ice core. Here we have the oxygen isotope ratio measurements, which are a proxy for Greenland and therefore Northern hemisphere temperature. And these red spikes record volcanic eruptions. These are sulfate spikes in the ice core. And as you can see in this record, there are a couple of different volcanic eruptions indicated. Now, the authors suggest that this one is the Larcher Sea eruption, although they have no direct evidence for that. It might be, but it also might be this one here. Without analyzing the specific composition of the tephra or the rock and dust particles in this ice layer, which they don't do, they can't know which is which. But as you can also see, there is no change in climate at all in this GISP-2 record 
when this volcanic eruption, which they claim is the largest sea eruption, happens. Temperatures are obstinately stable for at least 20 years around this eruption. In fact, we already know of a much higher resolution data set for this evidence published back in 2014 by Peteyev et al. Remember, this is the paper that first discovered the Younger Dryas platinum anomaly. Here's the platinum signal, which occurs right at the onset of this cooling, which was thought at the time to be the onset of the Younger Dryas period. And here is a preceding sulfate signal. Now it's important to note that these sulfate signals here and here are recorded directly in the GISP2 ice core. So their position relative to the platinum signal is correct, even if the dates on the scale are uncertain by around 100 years or so. Remember too, I showed back in video 5 in this series how this nitrate signal has been misplaced because of a typo in the earlier 1993 paper by Majewski in which this, this nitrate signal was first described. And actually it coincides with the platinum signal or whatever. Let's get back to the sulfate signals. Now we don't know exactly which volcanic eruption this sulfate signal corresponds to, but it might be the Larcher Sea eruption. Pete Evertal place the Larcher Sea eruption here, uh, where there apparently is no sulfate signal in the GISP2 record. However, the timing of this Larcher Sea arrow here is not taken from the GISP2 record. Instead, it's based on radiocarbon measurements. So it could be in the wrong place relative to the GISP2 record. In fact, this strong sulfate spike probably signifies the Larcher Sea eruption, in which case it's even clearer that it had no dramatic effect on climate. In fact, it could be argued that if anything, this volcanic eruption had a warming effect, not a cooling, whatever. It's clear from this high resolution data that this large volcanic eruption preceding the Younger Dryas impact had no significant effect on climate. So returning to the volcanologist's paper, the GISP2 evidence by itself disproves their hypothesis, and that is what they should have concluded. But of course, being good volcanologists, they don't. I guess they are swayed by the N-grip ice core record shown here, which appears to show a dramatic cooling precisely the same time as this volcanic eruption. But we know this is a weak argument because the N-grip and GISP2 ice cores don't necessarily line up. Even though both ice cores appear to show the same general trends, because they've been through a wiggle matching exercise calibrated to a radiocarbon dating scale or chronology, they still probably won't line up at every point in between. So there is no way of knowing how well this sulfate spike and this climate response actually line up. So no, the clearest evidence must come from the same ice core and it's clear that this volcanic eruption had no appreciable effect. And in fact, our next paper effectively rebuts this one. So let's take a look at it now. Now in this paper, we have another record that shows both the Larcher Sea volcanic eruption and the Younger Dryas Cosmic Impact in the same data set. Now this new work looks at ancient Czech lake bed sediments. And here is the main result. Now this dashed line is a measurement of thorium and potassium isotopes in the sediment from this lake at various depths, shown along the horizontal axis here. And it's another kind of proxy for climate. Now it's a new one to me, I've never seen this kind of uh, data used before, but apparently the ratio of these two isotopes, thorium and potassium, is a measure of weathering, in other words, water runoff or average precipitation. And in turn, this is related to climate because there's a correlation between precipitation and climate or average temperature. So that is more precipitation correlates to warmer climates and vice versa. Now this correlation hasn't been calibrated, so we can only see general trends here, not absolute average temperatures. Nevertheless, it does seem to follow similar trends to the GISP2 and NGRIP ice core records. So it does seem to be doing a reasonable job. Now it's clear from this data that the Larcher Sea volcanic eruption and the Younger Dryas impact are distinct events. 
And this time these guys do confirm that this tephra or rock debris, which they find in the sediments, is from the Larcher Sea volcanic eruption. And the difference in the timing of these events is around about a hundred years. How do we know that? Well, they also made an age depth model from the, the sediment cores from this lake and found that the sediment ages at around about 30 to 60 years per centimeter in depth. So we have roughly a hundred years between these events. And when we go back to the GISP2 data, that makes sense if this sulfate spike does indeed correspond to the larger sea event as we expect. Again, the difference in timing between these two events is about a hundred years. Okay, back to our lake sediment data. Now a problem with this data is in deciding precisely when the impact and volcanic events happened. You can see both signals are broadened or dispersed to some degree, whereas in fact they should be narrow spikes. Now this broadening affects all the data recorded in the sediment, even the, the climate or temperature data. And it's smoothed to some degree because of the way the lake bottom sediments are disturbed and because of the way the water runs off the land. So we have a hard job knowing exactly where to place these events. Nevertheless, the Younger Dryas impact does seem to line up with this change in climate here and the Larcher Sea eruption does seem to line up with this change in climate here. Does it reflect a warming or a cooling? It's hard to tell, but judging from the peak in the, the tephra, probably corresponding to a warming, not a cooling. So once again, this record is indicating that if anything, the larger sea eruption correlates with a warming trend, not a cooling trend. So I think it's clear from this lake sediment and the GISP2 ice core, the larger sea volcanic eruption had nothing to do with the Younger Dryas mini ice age. Of course, this doesn't automatically mean the Younger Dryas cosmic impact did cause it, because of the dispersion inherent in this data, it's difficult to make conclusions like that from this data. However, the highest resolution data we have, going back, Pete Avatar, is still the GISP2 data. So based on this evidence, that's the, the very close timing between the platinum signal and this cooling, we should still conclude it's very likely the Younger Dryas impact did trigger the Younger Dryas cooling, but we can't make a stronger claim than that. Okay, that's enough for this video. We've seen the Larcher Sea volcanic eruption predates the cosmic impact by around 100 years and clearly didn't trigger any cooling event. The Younger Dryas impact itself remains our best bet for that. And we've seen that the Younger Dryas impact might, just might, have involved at least one very large comet fragment, perhaps a mile across, which would tend to support the possibility it triggered the Younger Dryas climate change. But we will need to wait and see if the new Greenland crater really is of a younger Dryas age. Well, if you enjoyed that, uh, you can find out more about that from my book and blog, as well as other videos on my channel here.